Prologue, A Tome's Tale. Oh, hello there. So you've come looking for a story, have you? Well then, you've come to the right book. After all, most books are just books. Ink on paper, forming words and sentences, blah, blah, blah. You know the type. I'll concede some of those guys are pretty cool, and a few of them are even filled to the brim with endless depth. Wait, did that make sense? Regardless, I am no basic book, for I am a grimoire, and as such I am a most idealized storyteller. What is a grimoire, though, you might be asking? Well, 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 let's not get ahead of ourselves now. I'm not just going to spoil my favorite part of the story for you. But what I will say is that this story is no simple telling of magical fancy flung in your face as flagrantly false entertainment. No, this is the true story of my life and my maker's life. And if it is not true, then I am not a book and you are not a person. For I was him and he was me and we fought through it all together. Except for that one time he lost me. Stupid asshole. But still, two shiny halves of the same coin. Though in truth, after all is said and done, I may be less than a seventh of the original. Ha! <laughs> You'll get that later on. Or at least the clever ones will. But I digress. Back to the point I was forming about Grimoire making for ideal storytellers. There are only two things you need to know about Grimoire right now. The first is that we never forget a thing. Ever. The second is that we are all automatically pair-bonded with a human whose life always turns out to be rather interesting. And bam! Right there, you've got a recipe for some great stories. And this one in particular is the best of all the grimoire tales. But you don't have to trust me on that. You can make up your own mind by the end. But where to start the story? We had so many beginnings, after all. Still, I think I know the place to begin. Yes, I'm quite sure. Now let us first prime the pump of your curiosity with a taste of the past. Long ago, more than a century before William and I were separated, a significant conversation took place between two very powerful and important individuals. And don't you start nitpicking at the details just yet. I've experienced this very historical moment hundreds of times, just as if I were standing in the room when it happened. Don't worry about it, all right? It's just grimoire stuff. It'll all make sense by the end. Now shut up and stop asking questions. I've got to figure out how to start this damn thing, and I don't need you flapping your gums distracting me. So where to begin? Hmm... Ah! So there they were, pecking at each other like a couple of proud penile peacocks. King Anatar on one side of the throne room, and one of the nameless seven sitting across from him. The tension in the air was so thick you could spread it on your toast with a knife, though it would probably taste like dragon shit if you ate it. What? Oh, my narration is a bit on the colorful side for you, is it? And my voice is too nasally? Now that's just rude. But alas, I do see your point. My brilliant personality will no doubt distract from the story if I don't dial it down for the normies. I am quite capable of doing a more traditional third-person narration, of course. But still, don't you think I won't interject a bit of color at my favorite parts? It's my story, too, after all, and I intend to enjoy its telling to the fullest. But we've did it about long enough. No thanks to you. So now, without any further ado, let the story begin! Chapter 1 a Powerful Conversation, 1892 I must admit your proposal is an enticing one, said the man-shaped thing in its greasy voice, its wicked smile reaching all the way to its solid black eyes. However, if I am to commit to an alliance and give you the considerable aid of my channelers, I would first need to know why. Why should I? The hybrid will make for a powerful enemy, of course, and more than gifts of knowledge and grimoire, I'd require an explanation. Tell me, your highness, how is it that your people came to be as they are? And why is it that you alone have retained your immortality? The king's lip curled. I would ask a similar question of you. How is it that your disciples have come to be so powerful, being mere mortals as they are? And you? Me? said the man-thing innocently. Humans don't usually grow horns, as I understand it. And if my information is correct, you are considered quite ancient, even by our standards. So how did humans such as yourself come to be so... powerful? The king spat the final word while the man-thing tugged at the high collar of its black and white robes thoughtfully. It occurs to me that the true desire we both crave is for that of the other's story. After all, we both ascended to our respective seats of power from humble beginnings, did we not? However, my organization is not the one in need of military aid. Rather, it is you who sought us out to strike a bargain. So my counteroffer is this. In addition to your proposal of knowledge, training for our young, and the grimoire, give us a plot of land in each of your cities, 
to establish an embassy and to expand our system of banks. As well, of course, as a fittingly monolithic landing site for our portal stones. This includes any future cities your people might erect, as the tide of war changes, of course. As it made its demands, the Man-Thing's eyebrows danced upon its forehead with malevolent delight. The land is as much for my colleagues as it is for me, you see, and your generosity will surely placate them for a time and buy us a century or two to get to know each other without any complications. Lastly, I want to hear your story. Not the woeful tale of the Ashen people, but your story, King Anatar. Agree to these terms and deliver on them in full, and I in turn will tell you how I came to be more than a man. In addition, of course, to providing the full support of Raven's Crest Academy and her elite channelers to aid you in your war. The king leaned back on his dark steel throne. The crown of bone which grew from the sides of his head made a soft clack as it made contact with the burnished metal. A pregnant pause permeated the frigid air of the throne room. All the while, great gusts of wind shrieked around the sharp corners of the citadel, attempting to fill the silent void within. Very well, said the king finally. A plot of land appropriate for a bank and embassy in each and all of our cities, both present and future. And the portal site, chided the man-thing gently. Yes, and the portal site. And the story, reminded the man-thing exuberantly. The king pursed his lips. He did not like the casual manner in which this thing addressed him. But it was correct. He wanted what it had, and not least among those desires was an explanation of what exactly it was. Fine, barked the king. If it is my story that you want, then you shall have it, but I will not tolerate interruptions. The man-thing promptly folded its hands in its lap and sat up straight, somehow achieving an even greater level of petulance in this simple gesture, made all the worse by the way it sat delicately composed on the edge of the gaudy high-backed chair it had conjured into existence at the start of their conversation. The monolithic chair sat directly in front of the king's throne, no more than a dozen feet away, and no doubt coincidentally was just ever so slightly taller. I would not dream of interrupting your highness. Please, continue. The man-thing drew a line across its pale lips and threw away an invisible object. Once again, and not for the first time that day, the king felt a sudden and strong urge to throttle his sole audience member but he allowed the desire to pass unfulfilled. Then, after a long moment's consideration, he began his tale, slowly at first but growing in assuredness with each new word that he spoke. Chapter 2. Anatar's Story More than eleven centuries ago now, I was born to a humble family in the thriving capital of Lomar at the heart of Finala. My father was a scribe for one of the lesser courts on the outskirts of the city, and my mother made and sold jewelry from a small shop built into the front of our home. As I said, it was a humble beginning. Even so, from the roof of our home, I could look up and see the vastness of Hovarth, and even in the outermost ring of the city, we still fell within the shadow of his embrace. At night I would lie on the roof of our home, looking up at his branches and the wisps dancing between his leaves, illuminating him in all his glory and in those short years of my youth, I knew true peace. I never wanted greatness, nor power, nor even wealth. Knowledge, perhaps, but truly, all I ever really wanted was to serve Hovarth and my people in whatever small capacity I could manage. So, upon reaching maturity and passing my tenleth, I decided to join the rangers and spend the next hundred years or so traveling and guarding our borders. You see, I wished to learn everything there was to know about Rodaxia, and I wasn't content to read about the world from books like my father. I would see it all firsthand, and nothing my parents said could dissuade me from my chosen path. So I left home and made my way in the world for a time. All the while I learned and trained with my new ranger companions, until my nineteenth year of service. There were ten of us in the company, including myself, and in that year we were restationed to Fort Merhoir, alongside a full garrison of heavy-mounted lancers. The fort had been constructed near the southern border to oversee a thriving empire that had appeared there a century prior. The rangers were tasked with watching the tunnel entrance, and should the imps ever encroach on our border en masse, we would raise the alarm for the garrison and repel them. For the most part, it was a tedious assignment, and I spent my days reading, practicing with the sword and bow, or gambling with my fellow rangers. The season cycled predictably as we observed that accursed tunnel exit from the safety of our tower, and not so much as a stray imp appeared to wet our parched blades. 
We were so bored that we actually began to wish for something to happen. A proper battle, even, just to pass the time. How foolish we were to not appreciate those peaceful times for what they were. Then, one unassuming morning, we got our wish, and everything changed. Without warning, something emerged from the tunnel, and we hardly knew what to do. After all, it was alone, and it was no imp. This thing, this Vermothris, or demon in the human tongue, was known to me by chance, for I had read about their kind in one of my father's books when I was a child. They were counted as rare among the rare, and to see one walking before me was like tripping and falling headfirst into a legend. We had no protocol for such an occurrence, and the last thing my companions and I were about to attempt was to provoke such an unfathomable dark spirit, though it was, without a doubt, heading straight for the forest from which we observed its movements. The man-thing's eyes went wide at the mention of the Vermothris, but as promised it made no move to interrupt the king's tale. This demon wore a long hooded cloak of royal violet around its shoulders, like a Thelios flower in bloom, and wreathed in black flames that lined its edges. In shape it was not so different from human or elf, though closer to human, I would say, and dangerously beautiful to behold. It carried itself gracefully, much like the highborn lords and ladies I had seen on occasion in the upper rungs of Lomar. Beneath its vibrant cloak it was near naked, save for a small cloth it wore around its slim waist, and a blank white mask it wore upon its brow that obscured its features. Save for two, that is, a pair of horns that protruded from its forehead, and of course those solid black eyes that peered out unblinking from behind two holes in its mask. The enraptured man-thing blinked its eyes for the first time since the king's story had begun, then proceeded to wet its thin lips excitedly. The story, it seemed, was to its liking. After a brief but intense debate, our sergeant made the final decision then to keep these observations between us rangers, as the captain that oversaw the nearby garrison was a bloodthirsty fool. Doubtless he would have attacked the demon regardless of its intent or signs of aggression. So the fateful decision was made to follow, and to observe. I was among those who followed in the trees, and for many days we watched as the intruder took its time, winding its way through our forest at its leisure. It frequently stopped, sometimes for hours, apparently just to stare at the majesty of our forest that was, as always, in full bloom. Eventually, the demon came to a particularly beautiful meadow. From edge to edge it was packed with thelios that carpeted the ground in rippling violet waves. If I recall correctly, there too was a small brook that forked and rejoined to itself at either end. From up in the trees it looked almost like a great unblinking purple eye staring up at us. Something about the meadow seemed to affect the demon. It seemed to be in a state of awe, as slowly it made its way to the center of the eye, leaving behind it a trail of withered flowers where it walked. More than that, it seemed emotional, overwhelmed even and once at the center of the clearing it flung itself to the ground and began to weep, and then to thrash about as if it were experiencing great pain. It abandoned its delicate composure and cast off its few garments, then began to exude a black liquid from beneath its mask. This went on for hours. All the while the flowers of the meadow continued to wither, forming an intricate twisting pattern of death throughout the meadow. Finally, the demon went rigid, and with a long cry that still chills my bones to this very day, it fell still. The king shuddered in his throne as the man-thing's eyebrows pressed against the underside of its fleshy horns. The demon slept there, naked, for another day and night, with its arms wrapped tightly around some wicked thing, spherical and black that had formed next to it. So dark was this thing the demon had made that from where we stood it appeared to be embracing a midnight shadow even with the bright light of day falling directly upon it. And equally disturbing was the flowers we had thought to be dead. They had instead become corrupted, and over the course of the night they had devoured their healthy neighbors, leaving only bare soil and an aura of suffering around their now bloated stalks. Eventually, the demon stirred and arose with the void object in hand. It dressed itself and made to leave the meadow, though it looked to be suffering from great exhaustion. In hindsight, this well may have been the moment to attack. But there were only five of us, and we were deathly afraid of this thing and its evident power. So we continued to watch and to follow. As it left the twisted meadow, the demon whispered to the orb in its hand, and instantly the shape of the object changed and became a walking staff, 
though it was still devoid of any color. Leaning its weight on the new staff, the demon made its way deeper into our lands and in the direction of Lomar and Hovarth no less. That evening, as the light had nearly changed from gold to silver, it came upon a doe and her fawn. The king's story faltered momentarily, as a hint of sadness crept into his voice alongside the anger. Barely within bow range, and still the demon saw them. It leapt with such agility. I've never seen anything like it. It propelled itself off the trunks of trees, closing the gap between them in the blink of an eye. It broke the spine of the doe with the flat of its hand, but it allowed the fawn to escape. By the time it was done... Well, there was naught but taut dry hide stretched over brittle bones, and the demon seemed to have regained its vitality. We were outraged by this, of course. Flowers were one thing, but to kill a friend of the forest? A nursing mother, no less? It was a despicable crime, but still we did nothing. For after seeing its display of power, even in its weakened state, we knew this monster was beyond us. If only we had not been cowards. We might have slain it in the meadow while it slept, or before it had the chance to feed, but now it was too late. So we continued to follow until Hovarth's shadow fell over us, though for better or for worse, the demon was approaching from the opposite side of Lomar's high walls. We made the decision then to split up. Two of us would return to the capital with all haste and warn the king in council. We knew not what to advise as a course of action, but better to at least begin preparing them for this incoming calamity in whatever small way we could. As soon as my companion split off from us and began speeding towards the city, the demon changed its bearing yet again. In hindsight, I doubt it was a coincidence. It picked up its pace considerably then and made its way towards the base of Hovarth. Even skilled as we were at moving through the trees, it was hard to keep pace now that the demon had a mind to get where it was going. We fell behind and had to descend to the forest floor to catch up. We finally did, but not until we had reached the very roots of our lord, and I couldn't believe my eyes. One of Hovar's great roots had pulled itself from the ground and was extended towards the demon like a many-fingered hand, touching it on the brow between its horns. Even in all my studies, I had never heard of such an occurrence. Hovarth would communicate with us, of course, but only through the High Priest, and after consuming an elixir of the Lord's Golden Sap. This was something else entirely. Direct communication, it seemed, between these two mighty entities, and we did not interfere. From what we could gather, the exchange made the demon angry, for it lashed out then and tore a deep hole in the side of the root that was extended towards it. At this, my companions and I saw red, and it was all we could do to restrain ourselves. But before we had time to even consider a countermeasure, the Mighty Ones made contact once again, in the way that they had before, but only briefly. Then the intruder did the strangest thing yet. With a cry of anguish, it broke the void staff over its knee, then whispered something we could not hear to the two pieces. One half became a ring, which the demon slipped onto its finger, and at another whisper, the other half became a white mask, much like the one it wore, but smaller. It then slipped a pale finger underneath the mask on its face, and judging from the blood that ran down its chin, the demon seemed to have bitten itself. With its bleeding finger, it drew a strange symbol upon the brow of the small mask it had made, like the symbol your kind uses for the number seven. Then, seeming satisfied with its handiwork, the demon offered the mask to Hovarth. Hovarth seemed to accept the offering and took it from the demon's hand, twisting his tendrils around the object and pressing it into the fresh wound on his side. His sacred sap and the demon blood reacted violently when they met, producing an acrid smoke that burned our eyes and throats, even at two hundred paces. But the sap overwhelmed the blood, and it began to dissolve as the mask was pulled within the dripping wound. The man-thing hadn't so much as moved since the first mention of the demon, and now even its breath seemed to be caught in its lungs. Then, with its business in our forest seemingly concluded, the demon left. We continued to track it all the way to the edge of our borders, where it was heading in the direction of the ice-crowned core pillar. To our great relief, it committed no further crimes against the forest as it went, and then it was gone. Thus, we returned to Lomar with all haste, and were dismayed to find on arrival that Hovarth seemed unwell. His leaves rained down in an endless torrent of green, though it was not near the season for his leaves to be falling. This, along with everything else we had witnessed, was too much to bear. 
We felt the weight of our decisions in waves of guilt that threatened to drown each of us. Worse still, my lieutenant, my old friend, was beheaded for failing to report to the captain back at Fort Merhoir. His sacrifice surely saved the rest of us, as it had been a group decision to hide the demon's presence, but he took full responsibility to save his subordinates. After we had conferred with the Council of Ancients and recounted to them the full story many times, they unanimously agreed that the demon must have placed a curse on Hovarth. Such a crime was unconscionable, and we had no choice but to make the demon account for its actions, and if at all possible, force it to undo the damage it had inflicted upon our lord. A full regiment of five hundred seasoned and mounted warriors were organized and placed under the command of Captain Vera, though she goes by a very different title these days. But back then she was just another low-born elf like myself, though ambitious, vicious, and uncommonly powerful with magic. With her leading the regiment, I actually believed that we could succeed. We could bring a Vermothris to justice. I offered her my services as a tracker, and she accepted. So, riding at the captain's side at the head of the column, we set out after the demon. And as we rode, I came to know more about the unusual woman that led us. She wore her black hair cropped close to the scalp. The better for fighting, she told me, in rasping tones over her ever-burning pipe. She was not beautiful, but somehow handsome in her way, with skin patterned like that of an aspen, common among the people at the time, but heavily scarred on both face and limb, and presumably everywhere else. She had a mind of war, and desperately wished to see the expansion of our lands rather than what she called the endless babysitting of a soft people. At the captain's unflagging insistence, which bordered on cruelty, we sped across the land, and being in such great numbers as we were, we encountered no opposition. As a result, within a fortnight I had picked up on the demon's trail, and for the next two weeks we tracked it through the snow, until finally we cornered it on a frozen lake deep in the heart of the mountains. Our warriors surrounded it on all sides, and even as the captain ordered the charge, a powerful telepathic warning tore through the thoughts of all present. The demon's meaning was clear. If we attacked, it would show no mercy. But the order had been given, and frightened though they were, the warriors charged. At the captain's orders, I remained at her side, as the five hundred bore down on the lone figure. The sound was thunderous. So many hooves and paws and claws smashing against the ice, reverberating off the high walls of the frozen valley around us. Then, a fell voice that could only have been the demons cut through the air, and from under its cloak arose a great and terrible serpent. Its body was made of forked lightning and of black flame, but its teeth were as solid as slivers of obsidian. With blinding speed it struck out, tearing and burning flesh, filling the air with the screams of the dying and the stench of boiling blood. It was a testament of absolute bravery to those who died that day, for even those few who managed to get past the great serpent found themselves torn limb from limb by the demon itself. Though not a single warrior fled or faltered, even until the battlefield fell silent once again. Five hundred warriors and mounts and blades lay strewn about the lake in grotesque piles. Even so, the captain dismounted, drew her greatsword, and set out across the battlefield towards the enemy. The demon sent its summoned monstrosity to confront her, and I must admit, as I watched it rear back and tower over her, I was already counting one more among the dead. But the captain had a trick up her sleeve, the very trick that had made her known to me long before we had ever met. She had learned a rare form of magic, wherein she could push her body to incredible speeds and feats of strength, though at great cost to herself. The serpent struck at her then, faster than an arrow, and where the captain had been the ice exploded from the force of its attack. But fast as the serpent was, the captain was faster. And out of thin air she reappeared just above the beast and directly behind its head, ready to strike. Her arms and the colossal blade they bore seemed to vanish, and a great gout of black flame erupted from the monster's neck, where the silver edge had surely struck home. The serpent bellowed in agony, and so violent was the resulting explosion that even from where I stood at the edge of the lake, the blast reached me, and as it struck, I was knocked unconscious. I know not what happened next, but when I awoke, the captain was at my side, and the demon lay unconscious and bound with enchanted chains. Vera was badly wounded, with many of the bones in her arms and legs shattered, 
but between her iron will and her skill with magic, she was able to revive me before it became her turn to lose consciousness. From there, I began the long, arduous journey back to Lomar. I had to tie the captain to her saddle to keep us moving, and every waking moment my scalp prickled as I feared the demon might awaken and do to me what it had done to that poor doe in the forest. As such, the return journey was much slower than I would have liked, but with the captain in her battered condition, it was all I could do to keep us moving forward. Fortunately, my fears were unfounded, and the demon did not wake, and eventually we made it back to Fenala and on to Lomar, where we were greeted as heroes. The loss of so many brave warriors was a horrible blow to my people, but at least we had returned successfully, and despite the warmth of our welcome, all was not well. In the three months since we had departed, Hovarth had changed, and drastically at that. The last of his green leaves had long since fallen and begun to rot, and in their place was a crown of violet. His bark, too, which was once near white and very smooth, was now quite the opposite. Its hue had changed to tar black, and instead of smooth, it was like brittle stone and covered in deep fissures. Where it had split, huge thorns had thrust their way out in all directions. In places, the thorns had even pushed straight through ancient stone structures, which crumbled before the uncaring black lances. To see the capital in such condition, it was a revelation of the worst kind. Lomar and Hovarth had always seemed to me the very unchanging center of the world, the very rock on which our entire civilization and culture was built, and yet here they were, twisted and crumbling before my very eyes. But, holding on to the thin thread of hope that all this was yet reversible, I delivered the demon to the arena where it would receive judgment for its crimes. Captain Vera was taken away by the healers to be mended, and from there I recounted the events that had taken place to the council. For three days they deliberated over our next course of action, and once the captain had regained the use of her limbs, now more heavily scarred than ever, she joined us, and the sentencing began. It was an impossibly difficult decision, but the council finally concluded that we must at least try to make the demon reverse its curse before any more drastic measures were taken. So the people of Lomar gathered in the arena until every seat was filled and multitudes more stood outside. Hundreds of thousands of eyes bore down on the demon's sleeping form where it lay chained to the stone at the center of the raised dais. The void object that had transformed into a ring was still present on the demon's finger, as we had met with only failure in trying to remove it. So with every other precaution we could think to prepare in place, and every one of near half a million citizens armed and ready to fight until the demon reversed its curse, it began. Our most capable healers gathered around and began to revive the demon with energy taken from fire and from blood. Their theory on how to revive such a spirit proved correct, and with the collective gasp of my entire people, the demon arose. By the seven gods, would you take a bleeding breath? The king's story broke off jaggedly as he glared at the unmoving man-thing. Chapter 3, The Demon's Trial I said take a breath, damn you! Oh, my sincerest apologies, your highness! I didn't realize that my breathing was one of the conditions on which your storytelling balanced. I can hold my breath for a rather long time, you see, and I didn't want to do anything that would interrupt your story. However, it seems I have overcompensated and caused just such an interruption in spite of myself. Again, my sincerest apologies. Bah! You talk too much, the king grumbled under his breath. But it's just as well. I'm no bard and I don't know how to tell this part of the story properly. It would be easier if I were to just show you my memory and you can make of it what you will. Oh, that would be most excellent, your highness. Most excellent indeed. The man-thing clapped its hands together like an excited child. All right, then hold still. Beg pardon, your highness, but am I allowed to talk through this viewing? And where do we stand on my breathing, yay or nay? A slight pulsating twitch began near the king's right temple, but he ignored it along with the question. Leaning forward, he wrapped his large hand over the man-thing's relatively small head, pressing his palm to its brow and allowing its horns to pass between the gaps of his fingers. The memory flowed then from one to the other, fragmented at first, but in moments they were standing side by side in the grand arena of Lomar, just as it had been on that day more than a thousand years before. The healers circled the demon where it lay on the dais, feeding it energy from burning braziers onto which they dripped blood from their palms. The only sound in the great arena was the steady, sizzling plunk-plunk of the blood hitting red-hot coals. Then, finally, 
A stir of movement in the demon's fingers sent a ripple of shock through the observers, like a silent swell on a still pond. The demon raised its head then, and lithely began lifting itself off the ground without need of touching it. And as it did, the chains that bound it slapped uselessly to the floor beneath. Then, with a calamitous voice that reached every ear of all those gathered in and around the arena, it spoke. "'Where am I?' it asked, not impolitely. And though its voice was soft, each word rang through the arena as if the great spherical building were a bell that had just been struck a moment before, and all who heard its voice were terrified. The judge that had been selected from among the council responded, and his voice, though loud, was like a brook that wished to be heard next to a waterfall. You, he addressed the demon in shaking tones, are in the grand arena in the children of Hovar's capital city of Lomar, in the kingdom of Finala, here to stand trial for crimes committed against the protected spirits of these lands. Additionally, for the killing of five hundred of our soldiers, and above all else, for the curse you have placed upon our father Hovarth, the Lord of Oaks. If you consent to remove your curse from our father, all other crimes will be forgiven, and you will be offered safe passage through our lands. Furthermore, you will have the blessing of all the children of Hovarth to go with you from this day forward, and we will even consent to allow you to hunt the lesser spirits within our border, which is a right that has never been afforded to any other. Refuse our offer and the combined might of every citizen of our kingdom, from the greatest warrior to the saddest beggar, will descend upon you in an unending tide of blood, flesh, and bone, until you've drowned and your flames go out. Now what say you, demon? The demon just cocked its head to one side, as if perplexed by the question. But with nothing more forthcoming from the judge, it finally spoke. How was I to know any of these things were crimes, or even that these lands belonged to anyone in particular? Your people were too afraid to approach me, after all. So, how could I have known? Does ignorance not play a role in your laws when it comes to foreign strangers? But as for the doe that I hunted, you have my sincere apologies. If only someone had had the courage to inform me that hunting was not permitted in this forest. I simply would have waited to feed until I was well past your borders. As for the 500 warriors I slew, well, they hardly gave me a choice, did they? I even warned them clearly about what would happen if they attacked me, and still they charged to their deaths. I could have fled, of course, but it's not the way of my kind. Where I come from, that battle, however one-sided, would have been considered honorable combat, and the warriors who fell considered the valiant dead. Do the children of Hovarth see it so differently? The demon's words caught all off guard, even the judge, and silence fell over the arena for a long moment. Then, to the surprise of all, it was Captain Vera who spoke next. She cut off the judge just as he was opening his mouth to respond, and addressed the king directly, where he sat on a plinth, nervously observing the proceedings. "'Your Highness,' she said in her rasping way over vocal cords tortured by many decades of inhaling pipe smoke, "'the demon speaks the truth. It gave us clear warning before I ordered the charge, and were it not for the inflexible and absolute orders given by this fool—' She jabbed her head in the direction of the ancient judge. I would have at least attempted diplomacy before so many unnecessary sacrifices were made. This so-called crime was no crime at all, and the blood of our 500 wasted warriors, so far as I'm concerned, is on the hands of the fool who now speaks so carelessly on behalf of our entire people, and speaks for you, your highness. The captain's words fell like brittle stones to the arena floor while the king, lacking even the courage to respond, dropped his head in shame. And all that could be heard was the judge spluttering incoherently in his own defense. Pre preposterous he finally managed. I am not here to stand trial for doing what is necessary to defend our lands. It is this demon that must be held accountable for his greatest of crimes, that of the curse it placed on our lord father Hovarth. Everything else is meaningless until that has been accounted for. But the demon had its answer ready and casually dove into its response. Ah, yes, I suppose it's understandable that my placing a curse on your lord would upset you. However, he did insist on taking half my meaning, as it were. A rather egregious demand, if you ask me. The demon allowed the judge to cut in as he pondered what he had done. Ha! So you admit to cursing our lord, evil spirit? Well, 
Yes, obviously. He took half my meaning. Meaning is not so common a thing that I would simply part with half of my own as if it were a mere trifle. I don't give a bloody damn about your meaning, demon! Remove your curse or die! That is the choice being afforded to you right now, so make it and have done! The demon just snorted at the judge derisively, its gesture made all the more impactful by the powerful resonance that accompanied its every sound. They stared at each other for a long moment, but finally the demon conceded and answered properly. I cannot. You could almost hear the collective heart of half a million citizens breaking in unison at the demon's words. And after a long moment spent gathering himself, the judge finally asked, Truly, you cannot lift your curse? His voice took on a pleading edge. Our people will be broken without Hovarth. Is there nothing you can do to reverse this doom you've placed upon us? The demon considered the judge's question. Well, since you ask so kindly, I suppose I could forgive your lord, Hovarth. Or at least I could try. Forgive? We do not require the clearing of your conscience, demon! You foul, monstrous piece of... Peace, peace, old one, interjected the demon. The curse on your lord is bound to my hatred of him for his greed in taking half my meaning, you see. So, the judge trailed off. So, the demon went on patiently, if I can find it in myself to forgive him, the curse will be lifted. Truly, rasped Captain Vera. Truly, replied the demon happily. The judge, having lost any semblance of control over the proceedings, seemed almost grateful for the captain's interference. So then, demon, the captain asked, how can we convince you to forgive our lord? What can we, his children, do to help? An interesting question, quick one. To be completely honest, I've never tried forgiveness before, but perhaps... Yes? Well, perhaps if I were to come stay with your people for a time, say a hundred years or so, I could learn about your culture and in time my hatred might burn out, or even reverse upon itself, who knows? And with my sire still missing, I have nothing better to do, and your lands surely are the most beautiful I've seen yet. Yes! Yes, of course, the captain exclaimed, then hesitated. With the king's blessing, that is. All eyes present turned to the king with bated breath. Um, well, yes, he stammered over thick, soft jowls. Yes, of course you can live among us. If that's what is necessary to save our lord and people from this dreadful fate, you are, of course, most welcome here. The demon's response came slowly then, as it spun in a circle, taking in the packed arena. And do the children of Hovarth agree with their king's decision? it asked. The reply was tumultuous and near unanimous, as half a million throats bellowed their approval at this new turn of events. Then the howls of hope came to a sudden and absolute stop along with the rest of the memory, as King Anatar removed his hand from the Man-Thing's brow, and they sat once again in the cold throne room. I know how foolish we look in hindsight, said Anatar, but you must understand that our hope as a people was like a guttering candle about to go out, and by accepting this demon into our lives, our hope seemed to burst back to life with renewed vigor. Finala and Lomar in particular flourished from that day forward, as we united like never before over a common goal. And it didn't take long for us to start appreciating the new dark beauty that had taken over the capital, and Hovarth, especially now that we were confident the curse did not mean our lord's imminent death. From that day forward, the demon settled into our society and asked that we call him Gothnir. He explained that among his own kin, a great tragedy existed, and only males of his species could be found in their kingdom. Though beneath the mask, he was as fair in face and form as any she-spirit I ever laid eyes on. From the demon's own mouth, I learned his kind were just as rare as I had understood, if not more so, with Gothnir only knowing of a stark dozen others. And of those, all were scattered to the far corners of Redaxia. From there, every day since the demon came to live among us, he sought to absorb every morsel of our culture that he could get his hands on. And every night he would commune with a different family, both high and lowborn alike, for long hours, getting to know each house as if they were old friends. 
Every single day, he wormed deeper into our culture until the people loved him and worse, trusted him. He even chose a bride from among our people, to the amazement of all, and the bride, no less, was Captain Vera herself. There were even rumors that they had a child together, a daughter, though if they did, I never saw the little abomination in person. Regardless, after being with the demon, the captain was changed. Something unnatural took place between them on their wedding night, of which I cannot speak directly. Though what I can say is that the portion of the city in which they lived had to be evacuated while it was taking place. No one saw anything, but we felt it. A terrible pressure of flowing energies, too powerful for even our mightiest to tolerate. And in the morning, the captain was... something else. Still elven, but demon too, with long thorny vines for hair that matched her new eyes, the pupils of which had become a pair of jet black suns rising in a crimson sky. And, of course, a set of long, elegant black horns that protruded from her brow. The king glanced significantly at the pair of horns which adorned the man-thing's own brow before continuing. Our culture began to shift then over the years, and the old rituals that had surrounded our connection with Hovarth began to change. The citizens began to commune with Hovarth directly, a rite that had always been reserved for the high priest alone, and the results of drinking his now dark sap was... drastic. Those who drank were changed both physically and in the way they viewed the world thereafter. Though, at the time, it was hard to say that the change was for the worse. After all, the changed were stronger, faster, smarter, and filled with an infectious sense of joy and purpose. Of course, there was pushback from those who clung to the old ways, but the popularity of making the change burned through the capital like a wildfire in a dry field. And once the population was near fully divided, a full century to the day since Gothnir was accepted into our people, and his curse lay long forgotten, the bastard betrayed us, along with his foul two-faced bride, the now High Queen Vera of the Dark Elves. The filthy traitors usurped the capital in a single night, along with the change who drove us from the city with fire and steel. And while we ran for our lives, the demon and his bride slew the royal family, as well as the Council of Ancients. Only then, taking the heartwood throne for themselves, where the bitch of a traitor queen still sits alone to this day. King Anatar spat on the ground next to his throne and eyed the man-thing up and down slowly before continuing. I have a theory about how you came to be what you are, if you'd humor me. By all means, your highness, ask away, and should your theory prove correct, I will acknowledge it in full and bow to your genius. Once again, the urge to throttle the man-thing overtook the king, but he continued in spite of the desire. Was it the sap of Hovarth the Corrupted that made you as you are? The man-thing laughed and shook its head side to side. I'm afraid it was not nearly that simple, your highness, though now that you mention it, I would pay dearly to be able to examine some of that sacred cursed sap. But no, it surely was not so simple as that. But that is a tale for another time, once the remaining items of our agreement have been fulfilled, on your end, that is. The king frowned. He hadn't really expected it to be that simple, but he'd lost nothing by simply asking the question. You said, continued the man-thing, she sits on the throne alone, did you not? As I already know full well, there is no dark elf king, and that must mean that the demon has gone elsewhere since your people were exiled. Do you have any information or theories on Gothnir's current whereabouts? No. At least nothing with evidence to support it. Though, personally, I expect he does these things for the sheer amusement of watching a civilization break and now he contents himself to watch the fallout from a distance. And the High Queen, do you have any theories to explain why exactly she betrayed your people? I no longer consider it worth my time to ponder. But once I lost much sleep over that question. Did she do it simply for the throne and power? Possibly. Was she under Gothnir's control all along? Possibly. Did she do it for love of her husband? Possibly. The man-thing nodded, conceding the question. I'll tell you what, continued the king. The day I kill her, I'll be sure to get an answer to that very question, and when I do, I'll be sure to pass it along. Well, I'd certainly appreciate that. And if I may, your highness, what happened next? You still haven't explained the mortality shift of your people. The king grunted and grumbled before continuing. 
Chaos and shock is what happened next. Chaos and shock. With the old king dead, we lacked a proper leader to guide us through this turmoil. So reluctantly, I stepped up to fill the position. In doing so, I began to gather my people as best I could, near the section of border closest to the core pillar. Word spread through the trees quickly, and before long we could not sustain our growing numbers on the young borderlands alone. Without Hovarth's energy to fill us, it would have taken near the entire forest to keep us all well nourished, and we had but a tiny fraction of the whole to draw from. For 300,000 refugees, it was nowhere near enough, and soon we would begin to wither and become husks. So, I resolved to lead us somewhere safe, as the changed could still have descended upon us at any time and finished what they had started. We took what we could carry on our backs and set off for the mountains, as it was the only unclaimed territory that we could reach from where we were gathered. And by the time we reached the peaks I sought, starvation was beginning to dwindle our numbers. Not to mention the glacier worms, or any of the other monstrosities that hounded our steps. But, once we'd gathered, in the very valley in which we now sit, I made the desperate decision for our people to make do with a new energy source. For in the throats of these four mountains lies an abundance of renewable energy, in the form of molten rock, heat, and fire. It was our salvation and our downfall both. It restored the people, but the toll it took. Well, you've seen it for yourself. What the energy did, what it does to them. They lost their immortality as a result, and their lives are now shortened to be not much longer than that of your own species. As for me, they insisted that for my leadership and guidance, what small portion of forest we could hold along our border should be reserved for me, so that I might stay alive indefinitely. And whether it should take another hundred years or ten thousand, I will guide us back to our rightful home and drive a dagger through the heart of the traitor queen and even burn Hovart the Corrupted to the ground if I must. So, in the meantime, we amass our strength in numbers with each new generation and grow more powerful in the ways of warfare with each new discovery made by our tinkers. And with each winter, our high walls grow higher and new Lomar becomes that much more of a threat to the usurper. Which brings us back to the present and our interest in a mutually beneficial alliance and for the occasional use of your elite channelers in the pursuit of these goals. The king ended his story soberly, but with an air of implacable determination. His eyes fixed so hard on the man-thing's rueful face, the very air seemed to quiver with intensity. Tragic? Oh, so very tragic. But well told nonetheless, your highness. Your storytelling is superb. The man-thing kissed the tips of its fingers and released the gesture. Well, consider that item of our arrangement fully and completely fulfilled. The man-thing stood then quickly from the elaborate high-back chair it had conjured, instantly followed by the seat winking out of existence with a soft pop. Well then, I shall take my leave now, if it please your highness, and go inform my colleagues of our arrangement. We'll be in touch soon to finish ironing out the rest of the details. Au revoir, your highness. The king's only acknowledgement was a twist of the lip and a slight flaring of his nostrils. But the man-thing took it as a dismissal and twirled towards the exit with a ridiculous flourish of its black and white cloak. And then it was gone, leaving the king alone to brood in his frigid throne room. The End of the Prologue Interlude, A Tome's Tale Ha! So what'd you think of the history lesson, nerd? Of course there's so much stuff in there that you couldn't possibly understand at this point. I mean, just look at you. Sitting there, reading, not knowing things. You're basically stupid. Hmm, that must be really hard for you. But that's not really my problem, now is it? Though, if you think this is bad, just wait till the cliffhanger I fully intend to leave you on. But again, that's your problem, not mine. I already know how this ends. Now, in fairness, I don't expect you to retain all of that nuanced information. Matter of fact, I'm banking on you forgetting some of it. But in my opinion, as a book, one of the hallmarks of a great story is that there are lots of little things you don't catch the first time around. So, even if most of that went over your head, just trust me that it was indeed all highly relevant. And no doubt you will be rereading my story over and over again, hoping to add some meaning to your empty life. What? Don't look at me like that. You know it's true. Regardless, the finer points of what you just witnessed will only grow in significance as we continue. But now the time has come for you to meet William and Moxie as we get into the meat and potatoes of the main story. So buckle up, Buttercup, and let's get to it. <laughs>